Our speaker this morning is our beleaguered superintendent, David F. Lewis. We're so happy to have him speak to us on the events of the of the uh, the hour. And I'd like to tell you a little bit about his background before he starts. David Lewis began his career in 1979 as band director at Fort Meade Middle Senior High School in Polk County, Florida. He then became assistant principal at Cross Blue Middle Senior High School, where he subsequently served as principal for 10 years. While at Cross Blue High School, he then Mr. Lewis received numerous awards to include the School to Work Administrator of the Year, Florida Music Educators Association Administrator of the Year, <clears throat> Polk County Outstanding High School Principal of the Year, Education Commissioner's Award for Outstanding Leadership, Polk County's Principal Achievement Award, and finally, Florida Principal of the Year, which is a wonderful honor. In 2004, Governor Jeb Bush made an official visit to Cross Blue in recognition of the school's successful reading initiatives of Mr. Lewis. This was followed by Mr. Lewis's promotion to the district level position of Senior Director of High Schools in 2005. He was appointed Senior Director of Secondary Education in 2009, followed by his appointment as the Associate Superintendent for Learning of the Polk County School District, where he provided direct oversight for curriculum and the learning needs of 95,000 students, 6,000 teachers, and a budget of $126 million. While serving in this role, Mr. Lewis led his district in seven years of improved graduation rates and was recognized as College Board's Large District of the Year for the greatest increase in both student participation and performance on advanced placement assessment. David Lewis was appointed to the position of Superintendent of Education in Muskogee County, <coughs> excuse me, in July 2013, and in, on December 4, 2014, he finished his paperwork to earn his doctorate <coughs> degree in Education and Leadership. Karen, his wife of 35 years, is a retired educator, and has two children, Monica Douglas and Stephanie, one grandson, Noah David. Let's welcome Dr. Lewis. Well, good morning, and thank you all so much for coming out and having me here this morning. I certainly appreciate it very, very much. Um, before I begin, I do want to recognize some of the members in the audience who are, are certainly important uh, to this community for their work, uh, starting with one of my board members, Naomi Buckner, is here with us this morning. Thank you for coming out. <laughs> Of course, our representative Ed Buckner is with us, and we appreciate you so much for your work. And of course, Penny Newroth, who is one of the co-chairs of the uh, Vote Yes for Kids campaign, is uh, underway now for the So I, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to come out. As you know, I'm conducting forums, uh, official forums, for uh, conduct, uh, providing uh, accurate information, we believe, relative to the SWAS. And helping people better understand the needs of the district and how we're going to be moving forward in the next five years. And so uh, I'm going to be sharing with you basically the PowerPoint that we put together for that purpose. And uh, we'll entertain questions afterwards that you might have regarding uh, the SWAS and frankly anything else related to the school system because uh, you all are an integral part of making sure that we have equity and access for all children. And my goal ultimately is to ensure that we have a premier school district within the state of Georgia. We've got so many great things happening in our district that I'm very proud and I don't have time uh, to share all of them with you, but we still have much work to do. And that's what this is all about today. So I'll go ahead and begin. Can you all see this okay? Can you the light? Listen. So as you all probably are well aware, we have a referendum that the board has approved for us to move forward with to ask our electorate here in Columbus uh, to uh, consider a referendum on March the 17th uh, to, uh, regarding a SWAS. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So as most of you know, uh, SWAS is an acronym for Special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax, sometimes referred to as ESWAS, uh, pertaining specifically to education. 
And we're talking about a renewal, because as most of you know, uh, collections from the last loss ended December 31st. Unfortunately, the needs don't stop just because the collections did, and we'll talk about that as we go. So today, the overview is going to consist of focusing on our students. That is always our focus, and should be. And one of the things I have come to really appreciate about Columbus, one of the reasons I'm here is because in the past and to this day, I am still very convinced that Columbus is definitely about ensuring a high quality public education system. And in my view, public education is where morality and practicality meet. Morality from the standpoint of ensuring that we have a quality system for all students, and practicality from the standpoint whether you have students in school or not, we know the benefit of a good educational system in the public sector. We're going to talk about the SLOS and its use. What I've come to realize is that uh, as I've gone around, even though the SLOS has been in place in Columbus for about 15 years, there are still a lot of people who don't really understand how it can be used and how it cannot be used. So we want to try and make sure people are well informed about that as well. We want to share with you the proposed project list from this uh, from the SLOS we're proposing, the estimated costs associated with those projects, what will happen if there is no SLOS. And then, again, after the presentation, we'll be more than happy to take questions. So in terms of the 2009 SLOS, as you may recall, uh, the superintendent and board at that time uh, projected there would be about $232 million raised out of collections from the, uh, from the referendum passed in 2009. However, we had the so-called Great Recession that occurred during that time, which ended up uh, showing that collections did not, were not realized as they were originally projected. In fact, they came in about $194 million when it was all said and done. So considerably almost $30 million less than what originally had been projected. As a result of that, um, a few years back, the board made a conscious decision to defer some of the projects on the list that could not be paid for because of the lack of collections. Those were the Ford Gymnasium that were, uh, was part of the original uh, referendum in, 19, or in 2009, furniture and equipment, upgrades, and athletic facility upgrades as well. Um, as a result of that, we have, we felt like that since, or I felt like, and that's why I brought it to the board and they subsequently approved it, we felt that since these three things have been put back on the deferred list, that it was incumbent upon us to bring those back to priority this time because the referendum was approved by the uh, constituents that included these at the time, so we then uh, in turn brought these back forward to priority for the 2015 list. Uh, just to make sure everyone's aware that the option sales tax is a 1% sales tax on all retail sales in Muskogee County. This is significant because this means that anybody who comes and spends money on taxable goods or items within Muskogee County contributes to our school system, unlike a property tax which only affects the people who actually own property within Muskogee County. So in other words, it's a, it can really be beneficial from the standpoint that uh, we think that from what we've been told by the Revenue Office that roughly about anywhere from 27 to 33 percent of our total SPLOT sales uh, tax comes from people outside of our actual own community, uh, from people who come from various places outside the state. So this is one of the points I really want to drive home here is what it can and cannot be used for. SPLOT by statute can only be used for school construction or major renovations, for technology purchases, and infrastructure, new buses, and furniture, fixtures, and equipment. Okay. It cannot be used for day-to-day <clears throat> -day operational expenses, like paying for utilities and that sort of thing. It cannot be used for any type of salary or personnel costs. Uh, we, uh, I've had uh, teachers say, well, why can't you give us a raise, or why the bus drivers, or whomever. Uh, or they might say, uh, why can't you uh, add more paraprofessionals? because it's against the statute. We cannot use anything that's floss related to that for personnel costs of any kind. It cannot be used to offset a budget shortfall, or it cannot be used for books and curriculum. Okay. Again, there are people who say, well, my child hasn't had a brand new book or adoption since 2003 or 2004. I understand that, and there are things we can do out of the local budget, but we cannot use it for uh, from the SPLOS side. So when we uh, started looking at how we're going to determine the list, we conducted surveys of every school in our district. We asked the administrators to talk with their faculties, with their parent groups, their, their councils, 
uh, PTAs, PTOs, athletic boosters, band boosters, whoever it might be. And we surveyed those, and we compiled all of those survey results prior to the uh, uh, Thanksgiving holidays and put them in categories based on the greatest need from the schools. And so that was one of the ways we uh, started develop developing the list. We have a five-year facilities plan that is updated annually that we send to the Department of Education and that, that lists all the needs uh, within a five-year period that are realistic to try and be addressed in that five-year period. We actually have, and while the, the five-year facilities plan you'll see contains about $28 million worth of projects, the actual list district-wide uh, is about $175 million. <clears throat> we looked at our strategic plan. We, uh, several years back, developed a strategic plan in concert with uh, CSU about uh, how our district will move forward, so we consulted that as well. As some of you may recall, during my first 120 days in the district, I afforded myself the opportunity to go through the community, go to every school, personally look at and see uh, what the needs were for our district, and uh, so I used that recommendation in, in developing a recommendation report, and that too correlates with all these different areas in terms of developing our project list. I, uh, as most of you are well aware, this beautiful museum and our library system, and, and uh, this library and our uh, museum are all part of the school system here in the city county. Very unique, and I'm not sure how many people realize this, but I think we're only one of two school districts in America that I've been able to find so far that actually uh, have the museum and library systems also as part of, of the uh, uh, functioning of the school system. But nonetheless, I met with the library and museum directors and talked with them about their needs, and those are included in this list as well. So it's not just a school district, it also entails the library, needs, and museum. And input from community forums. As you know, we've scheduled 11 community forums. We've had now five of them, I believe. Uh, we have six more to go. And any place else that I come and meet and speak informally like this uh, to gain insight and input and feedback from the community as to what their needs are and what they see as being a priority. I do want you to know that we do have a number of school uh, schools within our district that are underutilized. And I said that, and that's in my recommendation report. Uh, roughly about 18 of them. However, the, the, what makes it a little bit more complicated is they're not all in one place. You have two open classrooms in this school, three over here, two over here, so in elementary, middle, and high school. So it's not so easy to just say, well, let's close down that one school. It becomes a little bit more convoluted than that. However, recognizing that, um, I asked our board back in October to nominate two people from their, each of their respective areas they represent uh, to serve on a committee known as the Citizens Facilities Utilization Review Committee, long name. But the whole point of their work, uh, and they are continuing their work, the whole point is for them to look at our school district and, every, and we've developed a profile for every school in the district, uh, telling them how old the school is, um, how many students are in the school currently, what the capacity of the school is, when the last renovation was done, and if so, what was the funding source for that, whether it's FLOP, was it local dollars, was it in the state, whatever the case might be. We also uh, looked at the projected growth in our district, uh, tapping into the knowledge base of our city planners over the next five or 10 years. So we have a lot of information for them to help they, uh, provide for us recommendations going forward about how to become more efficient and more effective with the space that we do have. And some of the things that we're going to be talking about in our proposed project list also work toward that uh, greater efficiency and effectiveness in our school system. But I say all that to say that the final project list that we have is going to be contingent upon what they say in their recommendations. They'll bring recommendations to me, and I in turn will then make recommendations uh, to our school board as to how I'll impact everything in our system going forward again to ensure efficiency and effectiveness. <coughs> So the overview is going to be, we've broken all the projects into basically four categories. Room to learn, support to learn, ways to learn, and other. And you'll see throughout the presentation, they are broken out in those various categories. So we'll start with room to learn. And uh, the, the largest one, a uh, large single project we have in terms of monetary value is that of a replacement spencer. And I want to say, I'm trying to really frame this in terms of the fact that we're not building new schools anymore. We're back in more of a replacement mode. We have lots of older schools, and at some point we have to start thinking about how to replace them um, and for energy effectiveness and also to make an um, efficient use of all of our facilities. So uh, I'm going to give you some uh, information about the Spencer High School. 
that some of you may know personally firsthand if you've been there or been there. Um, and uh, we actually had a, one of our forums there just this past week, and it was quite informative for some of the people. They just made comments about they just had not realized how bad it had gotten in some areas. Um, and I want to point out also, this is not a lack of maintenance that some might want to allude to. Um, the school has been, been continually maintained and repaired like all of our other schools. However, because of some of the issues that were on the, the, pertaining to the soil on which it was built back in 1978, has led to some of the structural impairments and, and impediments that we're dealing with now. And uh, believe me, I would much rather, if I could, if I was not throwing good money after bad, I'd rather repair the school and move on. The problem is, all the reports we have say we're just going to fix it short term. It's never going to be able to be fixed long term. So in essence, we're going to be throwing more, more good money after bad. So that's our premise for the replacement. Plus, it's obsolete, as I'll share and point out to you. Now, you can't see this real well, but this is the uh, uh, upper floor of Spencer High School. And each one of these areas that's color-coded uh, pertains to some kind of a structural problem that led to things such as, uh, like the green here, um, deals with roof leaks, the light blue interior structural uh, repairs, that have been required because of the shifting soil. Um, exterior structural repairs in red. The uh, purple is the HVAC, and flood is the darker blue. This is the lower floor, and you see the same schematic here as well in terms of color. Now, I want to point out, this is one of the cracks. There's, there are four of these. <clears throat> these are four of these that go from floor to ceiling in four of our classrooms. And they're about, you can see, they're about that wide. Uh, so these are not just little hairline cracks that you have from settling, like you not, might normally see. And I want to go back to making sure I understand, because this seems to be somewhat of a <clears throat> uh, point of confusion. <clears throat> uh, the district purchased the land from the government back in the early 70s for the, per for the relocation of this particular school. And I'm having to go back in this all based on my research, so don't quote me specifically. I'm trying to go back on the research. But... It was purchased for that purpose, and it had a large amount of what, uh, a new term to me, was known as plastic soil. In other words, it's, um, the, the soil is basically clay, so it exp expands and contracts uh, pretty frequently. And depending on the amount of that expansion or contraction, it you know, obviously has uh, an effect on, adverse effect on the foundation of the building. So you'll see this happening. This is what uh, has led to some of this. Now, I want to point out, because it's important for people to note this, and I try to make sure I always point this out. We've had a study done, and nothing is going to cause the building to implode immediately. If that were the case, we certainly would obviously move the students out and get them out of there. There's, there's no safety concerns at this moment. The problem is we can't say what's going to happen 5, 10, 15 years from now uh, in terms of both safety and welfare of students, but also, like I was mentioning earlier, we have spent a uh, little over $3 million to date on things just related to the structural uh, problems here. And in talking with an engineer uh, as a, as a, a, from a study he did back in 2012, he shared with us that we can fix things short term. There is not going to be a long term fix because the clay soils continue to expand and contract, and that's, there's just no way to prevent that. Are you going to tear that building down? Uh, I'm not going to do anything as far as tearing it down. My thought would be uh, depending on what will give us the most value of that property, if it would mean the demolition, and sometimes properties are worth more if you tear it down or just leave it as it is, but we will, it's our intention to sell it for surplus uh, down the road if we're successful in this plot. Okay. All right, let me continue if I may. Uh, this is another example of a crack that's running. And at the very top, you can see this is one of the things they try to do to try and monitor and keep uh, that wall from separating anymore. These are hairline cracks, this example, this, these run throughout the building. Again, these are, obviously they're not of the size or magnitude of the others, but it's still just an ongoing problem with the shifting of the, of the uh, foundation. Uh, this is an area that is, we replaced the tile here, I'm told, uh, four or five different times because of the uh, severity of the movement of the foundation that causes this tile to pop up. You may not be able to see it real well, but this is always an ongoing fix in that particular part of the building. This is in the chorus room, and what we're showing here is we have um, water 
damage that has through the uh, has seeped in from the leaks from the roots and so on that have trickled down through the walls and have blistered that paint and caused them to, to um, uh, basically expand. And then down here you see some of the same things down here where the baseboard was. This you see some more cracks running all the way up the length of the wall. You start to see where the roof is separating right from the, uh, the, the exterior wall. We actually have a couple of interior walls that have moved as much as uh, one to three inches. This way, again, they're, we're told by the engineers they're not, you know, there's not a, a safety factor at this point, but they are continuing to move, and at some point, they'll have to be addressed um, more holistically. Uh, this is uh, also another example. You can see some of the water damage, and because of the shifting, this particular door, uh, if you can't see it here, but there, uh, we have about three or four doors, but there's been so much shift, we can't close doors all the way. They've run, they're, they're no longer plumb. So the doors are continually being a problem, and then we see these issues that are uh, around the, the door and the door frames. I mentioned before that um, this school and one other one, Shaw High School, were built uh, in the 70s when they're under a concept known as open classroom concept. And I see some people shaking their heads who uh, have some familiarity with that. It was a failed uh, experiment, if you will, in classrooms throughout America. Uh, my, when I was in junior high school, we had a school that was built like this. They, too, have now since torn their school down and abandoned it because it was just obsolete. And here's the reason. <clears throat> this is an actual classroom, and right behind here, this, there is no other space behind this classroom. This is the opening to the classroom, and you can see it's kind of an odd shape, kind of a triangular uh, pie shape. And unfortunately, because the, the pie shape is up here, there's no blackboard, there's no smart board, nothing like that. So the teacher has to kind of work through uh, trying to move around and in turn, and you can see it's pretty congested. And if you were there, there's no way to really describe it unless you see it for yourself, but it's just not conducive for learning and teaching in this kind of a setup. These, uh, this is basically how we have 22 classrooms that are built in that design. And this is that pie shape that I was sharing with you. Like here's the entrance in the classroom. And then you have this pie shape, and then you have something similar next door. And so anyway, we have 22 classrooms designed like that that is just problematic. And somebody said, well, why can't you take down the partitions? Well, you still have the foundational problems, but then all you've done is just now you've got half as many classrooms. So it doesn't serve the purpose just take down the partitions. This shows some of the sinkage that has occurred. This is the floor, and this is where, at one time, these are joined together. This is the baseboard, if you will, and you can see the separation that's occurred over time between the floor and the baseboard. This is the exterior part of the wall. This has been, what you see, that white surface is um, where they've gone through. Uh, the, the engineers recommended uh, sealing this exterior part because we continue to have moisture seepage into the building, which causes all some of the things I was showing you before with the tile popping up and that sort of thing. Uh, this has been sealed, I think, four or five times in the last, uh, I think, 10 or 11 years. It's just an ongoing problem. And again, the engineer said there's, there's just really no way to prevent this from occurring. Uh, it's just a matter of trying to put more coating on to try and keep it out for the time being. Uh, here, uh, if you can see this real well, um, this is the brick facing behind that, of course, is the uh, exterior block wall. And because of some of the shifting that's taken place now, bless you, uh, some of the shifting that's taken place is the moisture has now gotten behind the bricks. And so now you start to see the mildew and the mold that's occurring there. We pressure wash this at least once a year, but this is what keeps coming back over time. There is mold, but it's not the hazardous kind uh, that, like, the, I guess they call it black mold. black mold. It's not black mold at this point. But again, it's, it, it's more of an unsightly thing, but I also am concerned that if you're in the south and long, sooner or later with moisture, you're going to have mold of different kinds and mildew. So much has been made about where this school is going to be. <clears throat> so let me just talk about that just briefly. I was not trying to be evasive when the first, uh, at the first forum when the question was where is the new Spencer going to be. First of all, I've never been associated with a district that actually kicked out a spot before money had been appropriated for it, but nonetheless... Uh, it, it's a real topic. So, um, but we had always known the other part about this is we are partners with the city in a land swap. We uh, negotiated an MOU with the city back in October and November timeframe. 
And uh, the reason I didn't want to say at that point in time when the question came up to verse 4, I'm just to be totally transparent, use that word, is because I didn't want to get out in front of my skis and compromise any negotiations the city might have been in with property around it. Anybody who knows anything about property transactions understands that. Once I had confirmed with our mayor and with her staff that we had, in fact, um, uh, secured the property and they were, it was not going to compromise any of their negotiations, the very next week I released the, the location, which is right here. Um, and people were trying to, uh, there were some that were, were thinking we were spending money for the site of the new property. That's not the case. We actually own two pieces of property, and the land swap will give us all the acreage the state requires for building a high school. Uh, because the state does have specifications on the amount of acreage that you have to build for a high school, a middle school, or an elementary school. So in this case, you may recall a few years back, we closed, made a decision to close Muskogee Elementary. So there's that property we already own. Here's Casita Road Elementary, again, that we already own. And what you see here is that property that I think a lot of people call rails to trails and that kind of thing, but this is part of the land swap that is being negotiated with the city. So all of this together makes up the appropriate acreage on which we could place a new high school sufficiently. And of course, to answer anybody's questions, before anything were to happen, uh, we would do all the environmental studies, the borings, and all those kind of things to make sure that we don't run and encounter into some of the same problems we had at the old Spencer site. We try to be proactive to make sure that doesn't happen again. So that's, that's the site. Everybody sees that, right? Good. Okay, great. All right, moving on. <laughs> oh, I do want to point out one other thing, though. People need to understand that I am just, the, you know, I make the recommendation. The board ultimately decides where a school will be built. Mine is simply a recommendation, as are all the things that I propose. These, this list, everything we're talking about are recommendations. The board ultimately makes the ultimate decision. So moving on with uh, rooms to, room to Learn. <clears throat> We've had uh, a growing incidence of uh, autistic programming for our children. Uh, part of that comes from, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's because we have more incidences of more autistic children or we're doing a better job of identifying and diagnosing it. Uh, but nonetheless, I tend to think it'd be a, it's a combination of that. The reality of it is we've gone from 189 students identified as autistic uh, three years ago to over 400 today. It's a growing population, and they have very unique and very specific needs. I have a nephew who is mildly autistic, so I can tell you that with, in his area, uh, for him, it's language. He's very good at math and science and music and all those things on that part of the brain. But um, linguistically, he struggles. So what he is, with a little bit of coping and a, a little bit of special training, he can then mainstream into the rest of the curriculum during the day. That's the ideal situation. But the spectrum, if you're familiar with autism, it's a very wide spectrum, from the very mild cases that I mentioned my nephew to those that are extremely uh, behaviorally or uh, uh, emotionally uh, debilitated, so, and, and everything in between. So our concept is, going back to those empty classrooms that we mentioned, I want to help to relocate the students at the elementary, middle, and high school wings within schools that are, have vacant classrooms. It's a better use of those classrooms, and it better serves the needs of those students, and it's more efficient for the district. And I'll explain more about that as we go. The South Library Branch Edition. Uh, our South Library Branch uh, is well utilized, especially after school and on the weekends, but they only have one room in which to do that, and really they've outgrown that space. So there's a need to expand uh, to uh, the South Edition to include more space for our students after school and for our constituents on the weekends. And the cost of that is about 600000 <clears throat> Now, going back to autistic programs, this is not a forced placement. I want to make that clear. This is based on their IEPs, an individual educational plan. And that is comprised of, the people who comprise that team are child's parents and the teachers who know them best. And they develop a team plan for how to better ser best serve that child. If this is an appropriate placement, this would be an opportunity for us to do so. Um, and as you might be aware, for students in special, with special needs, they can be served from pre-K as early as ages 3 all the way up through 22. Now, in terms of the renovation of the buildings that I mentioned, we have costed this out. Uh, we, we feel like that we can take an elementary wing right now, retrofit it at about, for about uh, almost 10,000 uh, square feet at a cost of $1.4 million. 
Likewise, at the middle and high school, find uh, a middle school specific and a high school specific wing that's currently underutilized, uh, about 7,500 square feet at a cost of uh, $2.1 million. And that, what that is entailing is taking an old classroom and retrofitting it uh, by basically gutting the room, uh, putting in interior demolition, rebuilding, plumbing, HVAC, electrical, security, architectural, and engineering fees, all the things that you have to do when you're rebuilding or renovating or retrofitting a building. Now this is what those buildings will look like. <clears throat> uh, if you're familiar with uh, special needs students, there's a model that's very popular in Georgia and very successful. And by the way, this whole concept is built on the current best thinking about dealing with autistic children that comes out of the state of Delaware. It is the premier uh, idea about how to deal with these students. So the Marcus classroom are, are model classrooms that work with special needs students. We're proposing 17 of those. We want, uh, we, again, because we know the spectrum has all kinds of students on it, uh, we want to have seven high-functioning classrooms. There is a need for staff and parent training rooms, three in all, three life skills rooms, three th uh, six therapy rooms, observation windows, and appropriate restroom access, obviously, for those students. Going on with our room to learn, most of you know Northside High School is probably one of our largest high schools in the district, and unfortunately, uh, the cafeteria is inadequate for the students we have there. We are now serving four lunches at Northside High School. And here's an example of a typical lunch period there. And uh, <clears throat> this is where the serving lines are, so you can't add more tables here. This is the kids come in here, and they come up through here and get their lunch. Then go out and sit down out here. And you can see it's a pretty congested area for lunches. The other part about this is, an, oh, I'll come back to that. The other thing I want to talk about this is, this takes four, uh, about three hours to serve students' cafeteria-style lunches. The problem with that is I'm taking high-paid administrative personnel, and they're taking three hours of the day supervising. I'd much rather have them in classrooms watching teachers and helping the instructional process. I also want to go back to, I, I meant to make this point earlier, and I apologize. Going back to the autistic program in terms of efficiency, <clears throat> I think it's important to realize. Right now, our students who are autistic are spread throughout the district. That means that if they have needs of services from specialized teachers or, or specialists or therapists or whatever, it means they have to drive from school to school to school. They're spending an awful lot of time in the car not working with students. By putting the students, if they qualify and the parents agree, in this setting, two things are, are accomplished by that. Number one, it's much more efficient because they go to one location and they spend more time with the students instead of windshield time in the car. Secondly, uh, we are required by federal law and morally uh, to ensure that our special needs students are mainstreamed whenever they possibly can. Somebody early on said, well, why don't we just build a special center for them? Because it's against the law. You can't just, they should be included in the mainstream or in the function in the mainstream to the best extent possible. So the least restrictive environment is what we're trying to accomplish. In this wing, they can get their specialized services and then as it's appropriate, go out grade level, elementary, middle, or high school and experience the main curriculum. So again, we think it's uh, both efficient and effective. Going back to the cafeteria, you can see how crowded this is. It is so crowded that they have now expanded to outdoors. And about 50 students each lunch eat outdoors. Now this is fine until it's not. <laughs> like when it rains or turns cold, like it's, I understand on Tuesday it's supposed to be both rainy and cold. Uh, so now we're adding to that group another 50 students. So clearly we need to expand the cafeteria at Northside High School and try and get it more down to two lunches big enough to accommodate our student population. Now, I want to always show people, because I want us to be the premier district in, in Georgia. I think we all do, that's why we're all here to begin with. And so I want to share with you some examples of what other schools have in our district or outside of our district that are considered the standard. And I'm proud to say with our 2009 SPLOS dollars, we built a rebuilt Carver High School. Look at that cafeteria. Is that a place you'd like to go sit down and have lunch midtime, halfway through your day? Um, I don't eat lunch in something like that, I can tell you today, but I'm glad our students came. So a lot of uh, schools from other districts are actually coming to look at the design uh, of the build in Carver because it's obviously very attractive and it's very spacious and students have an opportunity to really enjoy their lunch there. Now I mentioned Shaw High School was the other school that was in that open environment classroom that I mentioned. 
and it needs some help too to get away from that open concept. So we're proposing $4 million. One of the things that has grown considerably at Shaw High School is the ROTC program. Uh, and, and district-wide, we've gone from a little over 800 cadets about seven years ago to over, almost 1,400 cadets now. And Shaw's program is continuing to grow, and I think everybody will agree that the ROTC program is a great program uh, in our district in terms of building structure, discipline, all those things. But in addition to that, we are dealing with the open classroom problems, and I'll show you some examples of that too. Shaw does not have a dedicated drama classroom, so they're just having to make a regular classroom work. This is an example of that. And if you know anything about drama, that students need to be able to get up, move around, improvisational uh, acting, that sort of thing, obviously there's not the room to do that. There's also no storage. That's their storage. It's in the same classroom. It's basically a table in the corner. I know there are a couple of those in the room. And they just have to store everything on a table. There's no closet. There's no storage. No, no way to secure that. If they have bigger props or set design they have to do, they have to go up to the second floor of the auditorium balcony, which is away from the classroom, uh, several hundred feet away, <clears throat> go up there, get that and drag it down to the classroom or work on it or work it here and then eventually drag it down. This is that open classroom environment I mentioned. You can see that there's really no depth to this classroom. It's all width. And if you're this student right here, it's really difficult to see the kind of uh, something that's going on in the front of the classroom. Again, it's just not conducive to good instruction. To the point that high school at Shaw now has to start using lab science rooms that are dedicated for science labs to teach their language arts or their history or their math classes. And you can see the higher tables and the high backs. It's just not conducive, again, uh, for regular academic classroom. They make it work. It's just not optimum, for sure. But again, I'm very proud with the 2009 floss. We built Carver, and that's the Carver drama classroom. Do you see a little bit of a difference from what Shaw's having to work with? Plenty of room, plenty of places to work on sets, plenty of room for improvisational acting. If you want to be in drama, that's the kind of place you want to do it. This is also, a that's what a real, regular traditional classroom should look like in Shaw. It's still a little small. But at least the kids can see the board uh, fairly well. Uh, I've mentioned Fort early on as one of the projects that have been deferred, and that's why we brought it back again this time as a priority. And here's one of the reasons why. Now, you may not notice it right off the bat, but there are bleachers, very small bleachers here, and some similar to it on this side, but none on this side at all. We had a forum at their school last Thursday evening, and they had a basketball game, and I um, went in before I came into the forum to look at the game, and there were people sitting on the floor watching the game. And at one point, the referee had stopped the game and moved people back away from the playing surface because they moved up closer to the floor and had no place to sit. This happens to be the biggest spot on the campus for them to have an assembly. And as a result of that, you can see, because of the small seating capacity here in the bleachers, the kids have to sit around the perimeter of the gymnasium. I think we can do better. This is that same assembly. Now here's the current standard, also built with 2009's Floss money. This is the gymnasium at Aaron Co. Middle School. Do you see a distinct difference there? In terms of spaciousness, there are bleachers that run the entire length of both walls. And they can have concerts in here if that's what they want to do. They can have assemblies. They can have basketball games. It's the, the safety factor is not an issue. So clearly, that, that's the kind of standard we should be working toward for all students. And all means all. Um, when I came here uh, during my initial assessment and walked through the buildings, I was a little bit taken aback by our athletic facilities. And some people see that as not being important or being uh, secondary, I can assure you that for a lot of our students, athletics is what makes students get them to school in the first place. Once they get to school, in order to be eligible to play athletics, they have to maintain basically a C average. So I think there's a little bit of an inducement for athletics. But my point is, when you start looking at some of our facilities, and I guess I kind of equate this to kind of like the Stockholm Syndrome. If all you see is this, and you think it's OK, but when you start coming and getting a little more perspective about what other people or uh, other children are, are experiencing, then you kind of start thinking, wait a minute, we, we, we need to step this up a little bit. And I think, I hope that you'll see that in this presentation. 
So looking at the wrestling and weight rooms at Shaw, Columbus High, Jordan, Northside, and Kenner. That's the weight room at Shaw. That's at Jordan. Now here's what our competitors are training in. A little bit of a difference. Now I'm not suggesting it has to look like that, but from a safety standpoint, just imagine students trying to lift weights, a football team lifting weights in a small weight room like we saw at Jordan or at Shaw. So this is at Cobb County in McEachern. Uh, so it's a, it's a very nice facility. It'd be great to have something like that. We don't need that, but we can do better than what we have. Support to learn, ongoing system-wide security improvements and replace some outdated communications equipment. Safety is the single biggest thing. It's what I worry about when I go to bed at night. And it's what I wake up thinking about in the morning. How do we ensure, especially in light of <clears throat> the people we have out there that are very committed, unfortunately, to perpetrating harm on our kids. And we've done a lot of things in 2009. Uh, we made sure that you can't just gain access into any school. You have to buzz in. If you've been to a school, you know now that you have to ring a buzzer and they have to see you, who you are, and that's how you gain access. It's not 100%, but it's better than we had before. Now we're learning that these people who have a committed um, goal of perpetrating harm on our schools and our, our staff and our students, they usually go to the main office and try and take over the main office because that's where the intercom system is, that's where the police uh, tend to report, and that sort of thing. So there is now a way that uh, we can, with this uh, purchase of this particular program, can go to a school, intercept, and bypass the office and keep all the rest of the classrooms informed about what's going on by way of, uh, of our computer, an external computer. In other words, we can dis, uh, disarm the office and we can make sure that all the other classrooms, the teachers and students, know where the bad guys are and if the police are on the way and where are they. We think that's kind of important for people inside to know. The other part about this is we received a uh, notification from the city of Columbus uh, just in December this past year that says in one year, coming this December, all of our radios have to be replaced because we are currently on an analog system and they are moving to a digital system. So all of our bus drivers, all of our administrative personnel, anybody who has a radio for communication, we have to move from analog to digital. And that's not, uh, we'd like for you to, that's, it's going to happen. So we have, one way or another, we're going to have to provide for that. Moving on to that stadium upgrades, um, at about $3.1 million. We've been doing things to connect for some time, trying to get it up to speed. Uh, one of the things I think is important here, going back to Mount Athletics, it has a tendency to also draw people to the community. We do not have, we do not, we do not have a stadium anywhere in Columbus that meets the Georgia High School Athletic Association's requirements to host a state tournament. So if our, one of our football teams qualifies, even if they can be considered a home team, we cannot hold a, a competition or a, team, a, a, a tournament or a, a championship game here because our facilities are not up to their standards. And we'll talk about that a little bit as well. Also, the softball and baseball fields at Hardaway, Shaw, Jordan, Kendrick, and Columbus uh, are less than stellar. Uh, my daughter plays collegiate softball. Um, and then this fall, I went to Jordan High School softball field. And I was watching the girls play. And frankly, I was embarrassed. And I don't like to be embarrassed. Uh, I was sitting there, and people sitting behind me did not know who I was the superintendent. But they were saying, the comment was um, something to the effect of, you would think a district this size could afford better than this. And I think when you see some of the pictures, you'll, you might tend to agree with me. So let's go to Connect. Here's the issue with Connect Stadium. You see, this is our only press box we have at Connect Stadium. And uh, it does not meet the specifications because there's not enough space to accommodate media, coaching staff, uh, Georgia High School Athletic Association personnel, all the things they require. We are uh, probably several thousand feet um, lacking in our press box to accommodate all those aspects they need. In addition, this is our field house. And you can see it's a nice little field house, but it's little. There's no, no place at Kinect Stadium for game officials to take a shower after the game. They require that. There's not a place for game officials or the opposing team to change uniforms or shower. They require that as well. Why is that important? 
But my contention is if we can have better facilities, and not only is it the home field advantage that I think is important for our kids, but also wouldn't it be nice as far as, far as a uh, economic driver, if our kids qualify or we could host these things, people come from other communities to spend the night here, spend, uh, you know, eat in our restaurants, that kind of thing. And if the SLOS passes, it helps to pay for our schools. But on top of that, the benefit of becoming known in Columbus as a place that you want to go to, not just go through. This is the baseball field at Hardaway. That's the baseball field at Jordan. Here's the competition. McEachern High School. And by the way, this is not the home press box. This is the away. This is the visitor's side. They have two press boxes, a home and a visitor's. Now, I'm not expecting something like this because this is pretty grandiose. But I will tell you, that's more of the standard we're looking at competing against than what we have. Just think back to connect. Also, there's the field house at nearby Central High School. A little bit different look to it. That's the softball field in Cobb County at Lasseter High School, and his Harrison High School's baseball field also located in Cobb County. That's what our students go and play on versus what they come and play on here. Support to learn. Um, this is about, when I came here, I, I recognized that we did not have a systematic way of starting to replace furniture in our schools. Hardaway High School will turn 50 years old next year and has the original furniture in it. Now, uh, I went to Jordan High School, and, and I love Jordan's tradition, but I've seen some of the names of our city fathers carved in those desks. It's time to, you know, it's probably time for us to think about a systematic way of replacing our older equipment and furniture. So my proposal in this is to do just that, start with our oldest schools, and if this floss were to be a uh, 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 prove, start identifying the oldest schools and where we need to start replacing furniture in those older schools systematically and not waiting until it's a crisis. I'd like to be a little bit more proactive instead of reactive. <clears throat> also, along the same lines, um, some of our band instruments. Um, most of you might be, are, are you all familiar with the, the reputation of Jordan and Hardaway High School's bands in the day? Because I, I am. When I was at Clearwater High School in 1975, but anyway, <laughs> back in the day, <clears throat> and I became a band director. But my, but my band director, Don Hack, at the time, we were preparing for a competition. And I'll never forget it. He gave, he held up and he said, and he showed at that time a, a record cover, and it was record, it wasn't CD, or, it was a real record, of the Hardaway and Jordan Bands. They were the gold standard. That was the gold standard in the day back in 1975 which then made all the more of a contrast when I came to look at um, and start walking around our school. I went to one of our high school band rooms and the student got up and actually had to go to another tuba in a surplus room and take a valve out of another tuba and put it over here in this tuba so he could finish playing. We've got to be able to do better than that. Cafeteria and auditorium upgrades at Arnold, Clubview, Eddie, Hardaway, Columbus, and Kendrick roughly a million dollars. This pertains primarily to the curtains and some of the things that are there. Again, we're talking about original curtains. Uh, I went to a high school graduation last summer and I pulled one of the drapes on the back of the uh, curtain. Not only did it tear, but it fell off the rod. Uh, and you'll see some other examples of what I'm talking about. These are some of those old desks that I was talking about at Hardaway. Um, if you recognize these desks from your day, that's probably a, a problem. I'm also, these were um, and this is a Hardaway High School. I want you to picture that 300-pound lineman getting in and out of there. Okay. Um, Hardaway High School's auditorium is an outstanding acoustical auditorium. Great. But the seats are so old, they don't no longer make these kinds of seats. So when seats break down the front, they, you'll notice that all this back row, they've cannibalized the whole back row to move the seats down front to keep the ones functional. Again, I think we can do better than that. This is their high-tech sound and light booth. <laughs> it's on a cart, and then you have a cafeteria table in the back of the auditorium. I don't think I need to say about that. 
This is from Columbus High School, and this is pretty consistent. Uh, they've had water damage from some of those leaks that we've had in the auditorium over the years. And by the way, I was told by Dr. Crumbs the other day, I was asking about this. These are the replacement curtains that happened after the great fire at Columbus High School, and that goes back to 1983. Do the math on that. That's been a while back. We're looking at 30, 40 year old curtains. Things just don't last that long. But here's the current stand. Again, I'm very proud of this. This is one of those things that people are coming to our district for, thanks to the citizens who provided the 2009 SPLOS. Dorothy Hyde Elementary was built and opened just this year. Look at the difference in those desks and classrooms. Ergonomically designed, much more attractive. But on top of that, look at our high school auditorium. If you've not been to that school and seen an auditorium, it's beautiful. That's what other districts, while we're going to look at their athletic facilities, they're coming here to look at our auditorium at Carver. That's what every kid who aspires to be in the arts should have an opportunity to play in. Transportation facilities, alternative energy sources. This is something that is more future thinking uh, in some respects, but I will tell you, I, was, I felt very badly a few weeks ago. I had to go out to the Lorenzo Road facility where we keep all of our buses, and I looked at our mechanics. And it was one of those weeks about three weeks ago when it was raining and cold, and the mechanics had thrown a tarp. They can't lift the buses. We don't have any mechanisms for doing that. It's basically, they are outside. They threw a tarp down. We're laying in basically a puddle, trying to avoid getting wet, getting up and working on the buses underneath. We've got to be able to do better than that. So one of the things I think we can do is to look at a feasibility study to see what is the most recent technology for helping our bus garages, whether it's a lift or building a bay where they can walk underneath and work on them, do something, and where we can better locate that facility to help our mechanics and our drivers. Also, diesel fuel is extremely expensive, and I think there's a feasibility study that needs to be done to convert our fleet to alternative fuel energy, probably compressed natural gas or something like that. There are a lot of rebates. They're out there for helping to build fillings, uh, facilities. Uh, it's a cleaner burning fuel, and it's pennies on the dollar compared to diesel. In addition to that, I think I've had some just preliminary conversations with some of our community partners uh, who are interested in maybe joining with us to build a filling station, and then they could then, uh, because there's such a great spirit of partnering here in our community, they would be able to share our filling facility to use their, for their fleets. I've even had been contacted by a company that is a private sector company who, if we build a fueling station, they would pay us to fuel their, to fill up their uh, delivery trucks. So it could actually be a source of revenue to offset the cost of any of this. So I think it could really be a win-win. But I'm projecting I'd like to do about a quarter million dollars in feasibility study for those two items. Thanks to Last Blast again, we've updated almost all of our elementary school playgrounds. Uh, but we have about eight more to go. It would cost us about a quarter million dollars. Roofing is ongoing. When you have as many facilities as we do, you're always either in the process of roofing or planning to re-roof something. Roofs are good for about 20 to 30 years, depending on the material in which they're, they're built. So uh, that's an ongoing thing, and I just don't want to get behind on roofing because when they start leaking, it's too late then to start trying to replace them. We have 265 buses that make annual or make uh, daily runs in our fleet. 75 of them are 10 years old or older. That's roughly a third. Uh, every year that goes by, we have 10 more buses that age out. Uh, there does come a point of diminishing returns with buses, and the average life of the bus is about 10 years old. So you can see the need is there to replace that and the related equipment like harnesses and seat belts and the like that keep our students safe. So we've got to start getting new buses. And we can get some from the state every year, although the last three years, because of the allocation formula, we've not received any buses from the state just because we are not on that part of the formula. In the past, we would get two or three, and we just haven't had the last three years. So we are getting further and further behind. Our friends at the museum. The museum is now 28 years old, and all the equipment they have, or the vast majority of it, is the original equipment. And they need to upgrade and replace their equipment in uh, like air conditioning, heating, but most importantly, the dehumidifiers. Because you can imagine a museum collection, it's really important that the humidity levels be appropriate. That's important not only for our collections, but also for our ability to borrow collections from other museums who want to make sure the humidity is the appropriate level and won't damage their collections. System-wide refurbishment of nutrition and kitchens. Now, this is not a little real glamorous item. Okay, I'll admit to you. 
But some of our elementary schools are 45, 50 years old and have the original ovens in them and the original uh, uh, kitchen equipment. Again, it's not glamorous, but it's got to be replaced. It's just time. The older we get, the more we need a little nip, a little tuck, a little something, and it's time for some of our kitchen. Um, System-wide facility needs is reflected in our five-year facilities plan. As I mentioned, we have about $28 million of projects in those uh, facilities, and that basically benefits every school in the district because there are such a, a smattering of projects throughout the district to keep things up and running, whether it's paying the school, whatever it might be. We can utilize some of those funds and divert others to make sure we can accomplish everything we need to do to keep our district up and running and looking good. Uh, this is one that is, it's, I'll, I'll tell you, this is more of a want than an absolute need, but I think there's a benefit to it for lots of reasons. I've already mentioned the socioeconomic, or the, uh, the economic impact having a, a, a facility up to date that we have for our community. On top of it, though, you may recognize the fact that we only have, really, for, for seven high schools, we and uh, 16 middle schools, we only have one stadium at Connect, ours. Uh, we share a stadium with the city of Memorial. The problem is the city is having more and more events. So it's getting more and more difficult to try and schedule our games at Memorial Stadium. I'm proposing that we would be able to have a system-wide multi-sport complex attached at the uh, site to be determined later, but it could be at the Spencer location, to triangulate between Connect, Spencer, or whatever location that would be, and uh, the um, Memorial Stadium. Now you can triangulate services, but here's the real reason. We have been having to uh, have a lot of our football games on Thursday nights because of the lack of availability of facilities. Personally, as an educator and as a parent, I don't like the idea of my children being out till 11 o'clock at night on a football game, only to turn around and get up at 7 o'clock in the morning for school on Friday. But in addition to that, we're having problems scheduling because schools that we play don't want to come because not only we get home, it's a home game for us, we get home by 11 o'clock. But if you're talking about competition that comes from Macon, they play the game, they don't get home until 12, 30, or 1 o'clock in the morning. So they're saying, no, we don't want to play on Thursday night. So it really forces some issues with our schedule. And some people may, again, may not think athletics are important. This young lady, as I mentioned, she's a basketball player at Kendrick. And you can see right there, from, from her standpoint, Athletics are what inspire her to do well in school, from an academic standpoint. This young lady, it's a different perspective. She's a tennis player at Hardaway, and she talks about wanting to share her athletic talents and coaching with special needs students. It's that whole altruistic, uh, uh, different approach. And this young man is a football and baseball player at Kendrick, and for him it's all about athletics teaching him responsibility, and that that he learns from his coaches. And for a lot of our students who may not have uh, parents or parents who are working all the time, those coaches are basically uh, quasi-parents in many respects. Ways to learn. Okay, technology. Does anybody think we're going to see more need or less need for technology? More. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, yeah, and I think most of everybody recognizes technology is evolving so quickly that um, by the time you take it out of the box, it's almost antiquated anymore. We have done a great job in this district in past SPLOS and past administrations of getting ourselves prepared, but you're never going to be able to stay with what you have moving forward with technology, and I'll tell you why. Um, as you may be aware, we are now required on the high-stakes um, state-mandated testing. In the next three to four years, we have to make sure all of our students test on the computer. That's a requirement. So that, that has implications for infrastructure, bandwidth, all those things that we didn't have to address before. In addition, there's a bill uh, making its way through the General Assembly, Ms. Buckner is well aware of, I'm sure, that would require all of our instructional content to be digitized by 2020. Now that has implications for the fact that instead of just taking a hard covered book home every night of having some one-to-one -one device, whether it's a, a, some kind of a laptop or a tablet or something, so we have to be prepared to that, and that came up before this money was even talked about. So obviously, technology is going to be an ongoing, ever-evolving aspect that we have to address. So this lets you know some things, and this is something that I'm thinking is a little bit more entrepreneurial, but again, it's something I think we should consider before somebody else does. 
Number one, I've talked about making sure we can expand the infrastructure for our district to accommodate all the testing needs and so on. But I, we've got to start making a switch to blended online learning. The kids are coming to school already computer literate. We're immigrants in their world, right? <laughs> no, I don't have to say any better than that. But the point being is they learn differently than we do. I would like to see our district move to an online, uh, in fact, I am proposing within the next year that we have a Muscogee County School District online virtual school taught by our teachers in our district for our students and possibly for students of other districts smaller than ourselves who can't offer the curriculum. I would love to be able to offer Chatco the opportunity to offer AP calculus or physics or whatever they may not be able to do because they're just too small. But if we have an online platform that can accommodate that, let them come work and, and, and be synergized, I guess is what I'm trying to say. On top of that, though, uh, I'm concerned about we have students who just work better on their own. Now, we can agree or disagree, but I think it's important that we consider that option and that possibility. But on top of that, I worry about the students who fall behind because of health reasons. The homeschooled child, the school who's on the uh, on medically just can't come to school for whatever reason, they've had an injury, a, a, an accident, whatever it might be. If we have online learning available to them taught by our teachers, I think that's a great benefit as opposed to someone who comes to their house once or twice a week. And then, like I said, meeting the growing requirements for mandatory state online testing. Ways to learn. Program enhancements for fine arts school. Now, let me just say this. I'm very proud to stand before you to tell you today that we will break ground on our fine arts school this year, and it will be open the fall of 2017. Okay, that will, that's, I'm telling you that's going to happen. What I'm proposing is the fine arts school here was originally conceptualized over a decade ago. And there's still music, art, theater, dance, that's all still part of the program. What I'm proposing here is something that, once again, from an economic standpoint for our community and puts our kids on the path to careers, is the possibility of adding a film school. The reason I'm thinking about adding a film school is because, if you're, if you're not aware, Georgia is now the third leading producer of film in the United States. We overtook North Carolina last year. And it's much cheaper to add this into the program now than to try to add it later. So to me, it makes sense to do that. But on top of that, uh, the, the uh, executive director of the Film Commission just came down and spoke uh, to Rotary about three weeks ago. And I spoke to her after her presentation. She said, uh, I was telling her what I was conceptualizing here, and she said, you know, you are so ahead of the game. If this happens, your kids are going to have the ability, there are 32 career pathways, 32, not jobs, career pathways associated with the film industry. It would give our kids a leg up in this industry that's obviously growing. And secondly, brings people to our community. If we have the workforce here to do it, they're going to come to us. And they'll stay in our hotels, they'll, and maybe even move here. I just think it's a win-win for everybody, and that's why I'm proposing we consider that addition. Uh, a North virtual e-library. Our North uh, constituents here in the community, right now they either have to go to Britt David facility or come to this one. In talking to Alan Harkness, he would like to have a no personnel uh, tied to it, but a virtual e-library. And I said, okay, Alan, you're going to have to break this down for me. I'm trying to picture an e-library. What is that? And the way he explained it to me, it's like if you rent movies through a red box, it's that concept. Basically, you can get books. It's a, it's a vending machine. And you can get books from the library from that and return them there. But it could really be a benefit. And like I say, no personnel attached. It's relatively low cost. Uh, item that would better serve our northern residents. Now, we've talked about things that are specific to some schools throughout our district, but I want to point out there are things that benefit every school in the district. The autistic programming I've shared with you uh, deals with students from grades three through twenty or ages three through twenty-two. The addition of the South Library branch, security improvements that ensure the security of all of our students and staff throughout all of our schools. Outdated communications equipment. Obviously, that touches every place. Replacement or purchase of furniture and fixtures over time in every one of our schools. We bust a large number of our students every day. The older they get, and I can tell you this. Now, you and I may say that we were, we were sat on buses and they weren't air conditioned. 
They weren't heated, but somehow we made it. And I can tell you every May, I get parents who are not happy with the fact that our buses aren't air conditioned. And so this is, this is just where we are as a, as, a, as a culture. That's where we are. School nutrition, outdated kitchens. Every school that's old needs to have kitchens replaced. Technology, we've already spoken about that. And access to a North Virtual e-library. Upgrades to Connect State will benefit every middle and high school athlete. Same thing for the multi-sports complex. And system-wide facilities needed as reflected in the five-year facilities plan. That five-year facilities plan covers every school and their needs, something, whatever that might be. And the last is the other, and that's the $4 million that finances the bond to make this all possible going forward. For a total of $192 million projected in collections from this block. Now, I want to talk something that Ms. Buckner is very well aware of, that unfortunately, they've had to deal with at the state level, and we are as well. And that's the austerity cuts. And we've been hit hard by those. And it's a reality. And it, it's important because it shapes the whole picture. We're not talking about just the SPLOS, we're talking about how the SPLOS goes into the big picture of the financing of our school system. So, you can see from 2003 through 2008, we've uh, not received roughly about $31.5 million in austerity cuts. From 2009 through this past year, that totals a total of about $178 million. That is a SPLOS, ladies and gentlemen. That is a SPLOS. On top of that, Equalization funding has been problematic. In the last five years alone, we've lost almost $22.5 million in equalization dollars. Now, in concept, I have no problem with the idea because basically this is a form of Robin Hood that supposedly takes from the more wealthy districts and gives the poor. And in concept, I have no problem with that because if I look at Quitman County, who has very little tax base, those are still our children in the state, and we have to understand that we've got to help fund their needs too. But again, $178 million in austerity cuts, 22.5 in um, equalization loss. That's over $200 million. But despite that, because of this loss, here are some of the highlights that we can be very proud of. We built new schools to replace older existing buildings. The board made a commitment back several years ago we would get rid of portable classrooms. And I can tell you, as of June 30th this past year, there are no students going to class in a portable classroom in Muskogee County. Gymnasiums are air conditioned, and that's pretty important, especially in May. We were able to increase student access to new technologies and the internet. We've been, helped, uh, been able to replace some of our roofs. We're not there, but we're able to keep up. We've been able to do some security enhancements that I mentioned, like the buzz-ins to the classrooms and schools. Most of our elementary schools have their playgrounds upgraded to code. We're still about eight behind, which I mentioned earlier in this block to complete that project. This is something I think is really important. Accountability and transparency is very important to me as it is to our board. And we had our external auditor every year that he does external audit, he also evaluates our SPLOS expenditures. And his uh, uh, recent opinion is that we've expended efficiently and economically the SPLOS funds we had from 2009. In addition, we have a Citizens Advisory Committee who meets periodically and has since 2009, and they concur with his uh, uh, opinion that, in fact, the allocation of expenditures of SPLOS funds was in line with the referendum that was passed in 2009. And I think this still remains to be a, an important point. The good thing about the SPLOS is it's a 1% sales tax on all taxable items and goods. That means anybody who comes here from outside helps to fund our schools and supports us, whether it's outside of our district or outside of our state. We have people who come from Alabama every day spending money here. I like the idea that they're helping us build our schools in Georgia. So, what happens if there is no SPLOS? I want you to be aware. And this is just basic math, but you can do the math yourself. If we've lost over $200 million in various funding sources that I mentioned earlier, and then we don't have the $192, $192 million to take care of the capital needs I've outlined here, that means it impacts the local dollars. 
My budget this year is $264 million. Now that sounds like a lot of money, and it is a lot of money, but I want you to put it in perspective. We are the largest employer in Muskogee County, other than Fort Bend. I have over 5,300 employees, all of whom not only have uh, their salary, but their health insurance, all of those things. 85% of that $264 million is personnel intensive. Salaries and all those things for bus drivers, teachers, custodians, administrators, everybody makes up our system. That leaves only 15% of the budget to take care of all those other needs that we've already talked about, not to mention utilities, the books, and all those things that we need to run the school system. It's pretty simple economics. If I've lost $200 million, I lose $192 million more for capital needs, all that starts hitting on the one big pot of money that is our local, our local budget. Now, some people will say that you live within your means, and I would agree with that. But I need people to understand that with 85% of my budget, this $192 million that we could gain from this blast to help with the capital needs frees up, depending on what happens with the General Assembly and the governor's budget, helps free up local dollars that I can then hopefully look at buying my two priorities going forward are to compensate our people, many of whom have not had a raise for eight to 11 years, depending on what classification they're in, and secondly, to buy those digital books that we're gonna have to buy, because I want kids to have access to instructional materials. Those would be my two priorities, and I can't speak for the board, but that'll be my recommendation going forward. So at the end of the day, two things happen. You either have to find another revenue source, and I only have a few places to go for that, because most of my funding comes from uh, taxes or from the state through student um, FTE, or I have to reduce expenditures, and that's where I start talking about people and programs. And that's the same issue that the state deals with, because at the state level, there's only three big pots of money up there, basically. It comes down to education, health care, and corrections. At the end of the day, there's only so much money, and you have to make decisions. This is one way that I think is relatively painless, allows other people to help contribute to our school base that makes sense, and helps us position ourselves to have the conditions to be good to our personnel, but most importantly, position us as a school district to move forward where I know we can go, but I can't make bricks without straw. Just that simple. So that's it. That's the presentation. Thank you so much for, for listening to me. Now I'll entertain any questions you have. I'll do my best to do so. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, my son and I are very, very interested in your movie idea. We're that year. Mm -hmm. Is there any way that regular people in town that are that interested in that can help? I'm a former teacher. We want to be able to help. Is there any way we can help? Like a committee or? As far as for the slots or for the? Help with the film thing happening. Well, okay. <clears throat> yes, there are two ways. One is, and I, I can't, I gotta be careful how I go about this, but Benny Newroth is one of our co-chairs of the committee that's helping with the SLOS, and as I said, either directly or indirectly, this SLOS can help us get to that point. And beyond that, at the film school, if this all comes to fruition, uh, we will put uh, get together a committee. I've already got um, the basic idea of how the design of the building will be. It's actually been kind of I don't want to, this is where I get in trouble because people say you're being presumptuous. I got the plan ahead. I like to think ahead. I don't like to react to things. If I've got two plans of the fine art school, one with and one without, okay? And with, we've got it integrated into the building, and then it becomes a thing of getting with the people who have the know how about what kind of equipment we need. My whole goal here is to make sure we have, I can build the interior part of the building and then add stuff like films and all that, uh, the projectors, all that kind of stuff, later. And I have people who have expressed just what you said, you get this, we'll do this part for you. So that's what I'm trying to do, get the interior, you know, the, really the bricks and mortar, get it in place, and then have people help with the incidental stuff that makes it truly a fine arts and a film school. My goal is, because I'm a big believer in go big or go home. If you aren't, if you aren't the lead dog, you're trying to work to be, become the lead dog. This will position us in terms of the fine arts. It will become the premier fine arts school probably in the southeastern United States for just that reason alone. Okay. 
um, or certainly one of them. And then beyond that, um, then you have the opportunity to really start getting your name on them. And I would love for us, I don't think there's any reason why we couldn't become the governor's school for fine arts, just, to, just throwing that out there. <laughs> just throwing that out there. Thank you. Yeah. Do all the students in uh, Muskogee County Schools have access to music, art? Um, Good question. So, uh, Ms. Bucker probably is aware of this too. I read a statistic that said that 66% of the districts in Georgia last year, because of budgetary constraints, had to eliminate or reduce fine arts programming in their schools. We were one of the few districts that I'm familiar with that actually expanded our arts programming. In fact, this year, for the first time ever in Muscogee County, as far as I know, uh, we now have orchestra in every middle school. And we will have, so every student does have access to, to art and music. Now, not as frequently in some places in elementary schools I'd like, but we are making a commitment. Now, I will tell you, we've got some plans on. You've heard me talk about becoming a STEAM district. If you've heard me speak, you've heard me talk about being a STEAM district. By that, I mean science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And the whole idea is to ensure that arts is integrated into every aspect of our instruction from K-12. And we are in the process right now. I can't go into a lot of detail right now. But we are working on plans that would ensure we become the eighth district in the country to ensure that we are truly a STEAM district with arts integration throughout K-12. Wow. Um, I noticed on uh, donorschoose.org, uh, where I am a participant, it's a website that allows people to contribute money to specific teachers for specific projects, mm -hmm. and I have seen requests on there for, from uh, like Double Church yes. Middle School, where uh, they need new bows for their cellos and things. Uh, how is the funding for these uh, music classes and arts classes coming along? I mean, it seems like it's nice that they've got the class, but there's a real need for better funding. As, and again, is. this is a draw to kids, but the arts, as you probably well know, <coughs> do develop different parts of the brain that You're ends up the choir, you know? <laughs> in the academics. Yeah, I, I, I am, uh, like I said in the outset, the bio, uh, I have my biography. I'm a recovering high school band director, so I certainly okay. get it. And, and I supervised the arts in my former district, 95,000 kids, so I had band, chorus, art, theater, drama, all that stuff. I certainly understand the, and appreciate the value. And it does help the, every aspect of their academic programming as well, just becoming a well-rounded individual contributing member of society. So I certainly get all that. To answer your question, one of the things I did, you may recall back in October, we had some SPLOSP money that would, had come in additional collections. And I proposed the board, and they graciously approved, to get $10,000 for every middle school and high school to buy new equipment, new, ba new band equipment. Because when I saw that tube I was mentioning earlier, I said, we have got to fix that. We will never have enough to do everything we want to in terms of teachers and art and drama and all that. But we can do better than what we're doing now. So to your point, our, our arts community, one of the things I'm trying to do is get all of our arts people together. Uh, I've, been, I've been very successful in uh, Rick McKnight at the River Center and some others. And figure out how we can synergize and collaborate to ensure that this whole thing comes together instead of, because I would find out in, in my going through and doing my 120 days, we have such great support in this community, but sometimes nobody realizes what other people are doing and they're kind of working in isolation in pockets. And one, one example of that is uh, reading, literacy. And we had a, a group meeting about, uh, well, it was just before the holidays, I can't remember the exact when it was, but. Um, I asked everybody who had anything to do with literacy to come and meet at this very building. Forty-three different entities showed up. And they had no idea that other people in the community were doing some of the similar work. So we started talking about, let's make sure that what you do, we're all doing in a consistent approach. You work on pre-K and early childhood. You work on upper elementary. You work on the secondary level. You work on post-secondary. So people have now started really planning and thinking through things and doing systemically what we need to do. I think we will do the same thing with the arts as we move forward because this process I mentioned about will be about a two to three year application process. It's that in depth and it's going to require a lot of 
synergy and symbiotic planning together. And that's going to be one of the things that I'm going to be working with others to try and pull that all together to ensure that we do have the uh, funding, or at least maximize the funding we do have available to us. I want to do the right thing and get us where we 